Hi everyone, Clara is glad to meet you here again. Welcome to Difference Frames the World, an alternative voice to mainstream media. Today, we want to summarize the Chinese ambassador to the US, Qin Gang's answers to mainstream media on August 16, 2022. Over 10 world-renowned media agencies participated in the interview. Still, few of them, if not zero, reported the Chinese ambassador's remarks that day. The job of some Western media is to ask China questions, not deliver China's answers to their audiences. The topics of the joint interview cover China-US relations, the Taiwan crisis, Hong Kong-related issues, and China's diplomacy. The first question was from Josh Rogan with the Washington Post regarding the remarks of the Chinese ambassador to France, who said on two separate occasions that the Chinese government was planning to re-educate the Taiwanese people after reunification. Josh Rogan wanted Qin Gang to clarify how China mainland would re-educate the Taiwanese people after reunification. Qin Gang replied, I don't know under what circumstances and in what context our ambassador to France said this. But my personal understanding is that people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait are Chinese, and the mainland and Taiwan belong to one and same China. We need to reinforce our identity, our national identity. So this is what he means, but I can't speak for him. Josh Rogan asked another question about the preferable peaceful reunification of Taiwan with China mainland, which Qin Gang had previously stated in an article published in the Washington Post. It seems that you need to persuade the Taiwanese people to join back with China voluntarily. How's that going? How goes your efforts to win the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese people? You think it's working? Qin Gang answered, as a matter of fact, over the past years, the mainland has done many things to promote the peaceful development of cross-strait relations. We have shown our goodwill. Taiwan is a small place. Its market is limited, and Taiwan has little room to develop its economy and livelihood. The future of Taiwan depends on the reunification with the mainland, and over the past decades we've done so much. For example, one million Taiwanese people live and work on the mainland. They are happy. They are doing their business, and they are opening their factories. They are studying on the mainland. Over the past years, the trade volume has doubled to more than $320 billion. Taiwan enjoyed $170 billion in surplus. The mainland is the largest trading partner and the largest source of trade surplus for Taiwan. And the Chinese people on both sides frequently travel across the Taiwan Strait. I hope my answer helps enhance the understanding and mutual understanding. Josh Rogan then pressed the Chinese ambassador, so why do you think the Taiwanese people overwhelmingly say they don't want to join the mainland? Qin Gang did not answer the inflammatory question directly, we try to achieve peaceful reunification. It is our wish because we believe that it serves the interests of the people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. People on both sides are compatriots. The last thing we do is fight with our compatriots. We will make our utmost efforts and show the greatest sincerity to achieve peaceful reunification. The reason for us not to abandon non-peaceful means for reunification is not targeting at the Chinese people in Taiwan. It is to deter a small number of separatist forces and to deter foreign intervention. For the arrangements after the reunification, we have proposed the philosophy of one country, two systems. This is the best design for Taiwan. One country, two systems, was first put forward to resolve the Taiwan question. It has fully considered Taiwan's realities, and it's conducive to Taiwan's long-term stability and prosperity. As for how to deliver it, we will take suggestions from people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait and fully accommodate the interests, sentiments of our brothers and sisters in Taiwan. One country, two systems, is still the most inclusive solution to resolve the Taiwan question. It's a peaceful, democratic and win-win solution that shows our goodwill. Different political systems are not an obstacle to reunification, and they are not a pretext to separate Taiwan from China. So we believe that as the Chinese nation realizes reunification, there will be greater room and possibilities for the implementation of the Taiwan solution of two systems. This is the first part of the joint interview with the Chinese ambassador to the United States, Qin Gang, but it is not the end of the first video yet. 
The Chinese diplomat did not answer Josh Rogan's predetermined question about why the Taiwanese people overwhelmingly say they don't want to join the mainland. We would like to answer it on his behalf here. The Washington Post reporter, Josh Rogan, should carefully check Taiwan's map and study what most of Taiwan's street names mean to the Chinese on both sides of the strait. Many of Taiwan's streets are named after China mainland provinces, cities, historic relics and celebrities, which clearly shows the attachment of the Taiwanese people to China mainland. Many people in Taiwan prefer to say they are from Shandong, Zhejiang, Guangdong, or other provinces, instead of saying they are from Taiwan. Even Tsai Ing-wen, the elected Taiwan representative, identified her as Chinese before taking office. However, the DPP government in Taiwan has been trying to remove China's influence from the island. Many separatists prefer Japan to China mainland, which is why Japanese politicians, like the assassinated former Japanese prime minister, wanted to visit Taiwan before his death. Taiwan preserves more Chinese traditions than most places in China mainland, and people on the island still use traditional Chinese, which enables them to understand China's written history with little difficulty. We do not know why Josh Rogan said the Taiwanese people overwhelmingly say they don't want to join the mainland. He is mixing a political concept with an identity issue. Mainland means Beijing's government, which the United Nations recognizes as the only legal authority representing the one and same China. For many years, Taiwan's independence elements have been labeling China's mainland as a chaotic state where people are poor and wretched, with no freedom and human rights. The reality is China's mainland has outgrown Taiwan Island at speed faster by tenfold. Taiwanese people can stay as is after reunification with the one country, two systems, design, just like people in Hong Kong and Macau. Moreover, Taiwan's taxpayers do not have to foot the bill for visiting U.S. Congress members and officials representing America's arms dealers in billions annually. They will enjoy a better life after reuniting with the mainland. Only some evil politicians have hidden agendas to secure economic and political gains. However, with the suspension of Taiwan's imports to the mainland after Nancy Pelosi's visit, those clowns' economic interests have been substantially squeezed. The separatists will still get briberies and undertable money from anti-China forces. Still, voters will kick them out of office if they continue treachery conspiracies. On August 16, 2022, China mainland sanctioned some Taiwan independence elements, forbidding them and their relatives to enter China mainland, Hong Kong and Macau. All related enterprises are not allowed to do business in the mentioned areas. As the only so-called democracy in China, Taiwan's politics is entirely money-driven. When Taiwan's companies have to choose from Taiwan's separationists and the world's biggest market, China mainland, most of them will cut ties with those elements on the list. The Taiwan independence element list is incomplete, and Tsai Ing-wen is not on it. It means Beijing still wants to keep the door open. For quite a long time, the DPP government on the island brags about its so-called democracy, saying people can speak louder if their voices are not heard. The reality is when Tsai Ing-wen delivered a speech during Beijing's military drills, her guards directly dragged protesters out of the press room. When people on the island realize they cannot count on the US and Japan for the so-called democracy, freedom and human rights, and that they might become cannon fodder in case of a proxy war with Beijing, they will eventually identify themselves proudly as part of the Chinese nation. Also, Taiwanese people should know they are not joining the mainland as Tier 2 citizens. Instead, they will become the same Chinese as their 1.4 billion compatriots in the mainland, Hong Kong, Macau and overseas. Taiwan is still Taiwan, and Taiwanese are still Taiwanese. However, they are not lonely anymore, as they are part of the Chinese nation, not Tier 3 Icelanders in the eyes of the United States and its allies. Steve Clemens from The Hill exchanged opinions with Qin Gang on a question regarding America's accusation of China using Nancy Pelosi's trip as an excuse to escalate the situation. He said that one of the features he saw in this was that a lot in the administration had severe reservations about Nancy Pelosi's trip, meaning the U.S. government is highly divided on the issue. He asked the Chinese ambassador, who in the administration had said that China was using this pretext to change the status quo in Taiwan. Qin Gang said it was a secret. 
A senior official of the National Security Council had a press briefing last week, blaming China for escalating the situation and using the visit as a pretext. Steve Clemens then confirmed Kurt Campbell condemned China in this regard, which Qin Gang agreed, saying it was widely reported on media. Philippe Kine from Politico asked Qin Gang about the phenomenon of Chinophobia in the United States, say Missouri, Pennsylvania, and other places, where the idea of China threat is a big part of the political rhetoric and discourse. He assumed that the Chinese army's response to Pelosi's visit to Taiwan would accentuate that. He rephrased his question, saying, are you concerned that we're going to see this idea of China threat being part of midterm election rhetoric? I wonder, do you have a message to U.S. lawmakers and to U.S. voters about how they should be seeing China? Thank you. Ching Gang replied, I've been here as the ambassador for a year. And I have found that I'm in an environment of threat phobia. My country is being greatly misperceived and miscalculated as a challenge or even a threat to the United States, as you mentioned just now. And this relationship, which is so important and consequential, is now being driven by fear, not by common interests and responsibilities. If you listen to the words and see the behaviors of the politicians in this country, it's not difficult to draw this conclusion. But I want to say that China is not a threat, and it's not a challenge. China's development is just to get a better life for its people, and we do not intend to replace the United States and destroy it. We just want our people to lead happy life. We need a peaceful and cooperative external environment to focus on our domestic construction, particularly in our relations with the United States. But sadly, our intention is misunderstood. So I hope people can get rid of the threat phobia and not blame China for every problem of this country. China and the United States are different. China cannot change the United States. The United States cannot change China. We have differences. But differences cannot justify groundless blame and crazy, unreasonable words and deeds. And we should not let differences and disagreements stand at the center of the stage of our relations. We should not let them define our relations. If people handle this relationship out of fear of China, it will cause tensions after tensions. It will put our relations on the wrong track and very dangerously lead our relations to the course or direction of conflict and confrontation. Mary Louise Kelly from NPR asked Qin Gang about the viral conversations in Washington over what lessons China is taking from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. She wanted the ambassador to revisit Ukraine's conflict from a Chinese diplomat's perspective. What are you learning as you watch the war unfolding in Ukraine? Do you see parallels? Do you see differences? Qin Gang answered her questions with a new question, what lessons should the United States take from the Ukraine crisis? China is not a party in the crisis, not in history, not in reality, and everybody knows the root cause of the crisis. This is not between China and Ukraine. China is not NATO. Why did this crisis happen? There are historical complexities and realistic considerations. What Russia wants cannot be given by China. China is a force for peace. At the very beginning of the crisis, China calls for peace, a ceasefire, and a political solution through diplomatic consultations. And we don't send weapons or ammunition. China has sent to Ukraine, sleeping bags, medicine, and humanitarian aid. So if there's any lesson to be drawn by the United States, by NATO, or by other parties involved, maybe that is how to achieve security. A country cannot build its security at the cost of other countries. And all countries' legitimate security concerns have to be taken into consideration. It's not a zero-sum game, and a Cold War mentality is not a solution to security issues in the modern world. That's why Chinese President Xi Jinping has proposed the Global Security Initiative, calling for all countries to join hands in building up common, comprehensive, shared and sustainable security. I do hope that sooner or later, the parties concerned in the crisis will come to the negotiation table to find a way out of the current difficulty so that people can negotiate a future security framework. David Ignatius from The Washington Post asked the ambassador about strategic stability between the United States and China. You spoke in Aspen, I remember, about the importance of stability between the two countries. 
President Biden, in his phone call with President Xi last November, proposed that there be talks about strategic stability between these two nuclear powers. But so far as I know, those talks have not proceeded to any meaningful level despite your comments in Aspen and other Chinese comments. So a question at a time when the tensions between the US and China are so obviously high and dangerous over Taiwan, is China ready for these conversations? And do you expect that President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden may meet this year to discuss this and other issues? Qin Gang said he had no idea about the possible summit between the presidents. We believe the Chinese ambassador, like the Chinese President Xi Jinping, does not have faith in the so-called summit between the US and Chinese leaders. In previous videos, we questioned the sincerity of Joe Biden's promises, and we also raised the question of whether China should trust the United States once again. However, Qin Gang is a seasoned diplomat who can't show his disdain like ordinary commentators. I have no information to share with you on this. And on strategic stability, China values a stable relationship with the US. We also believe that as members of P5 in the United Nations Security Council, China and the United States share joint responsibility for world peace and stability. We want to have communication and dialogue with the US side on this. But our understanding of strategic stability is not only about the military. It's not only on military terms. Actually, it's about the political foundation. It's like a house that needs a solid foundation to be firm and stable. The same theory applies to state-to-state -state relations. So what is the foundation of China and US relations? That is the One China Principle. That is the stipulations of the three joint communiques. We cannot talk about strategic stability without paying attention to the political foundation of our bilateral relations. Suppose the political foundation, particularly the One China principle, is eroded and undermined. In that case, the whole building of China and US relations will be shaken, and it's not good for our two countries and not suitable for the world. Paul Beckett from the Wall Street Journal asked about cooperation between the two countries suspended after Pelosi's visit, such as climate change. He asked the ambassador what the United States should do to resume those cooperations, and he clarified that Qin Gang could talk about any of the frozen places. Qin Gang replied, We are taking countermeasures. They should not be surprises. Before the visit, we warned the US side repeatedly that if she went, it would have severe consequences on our exchanges and cooperation between our two countries. Still, it happened. And we mean what we say. We suspended dialogue, communication and cooperation on some subjects in some areas including climate change. The US said China is punishing the world by suspending the climate dialogue. But the question is, does the United States represent the world? Paul Beckett pushed, but what do you want to see to resume? Qin Gang responded, to resume, I want to see the United States at the moment think about its behavior on Taiwan, to reflect on what the true One China principle is, and to refrain from doing anything more to escalate the tension, because there are some worries around these days in China that the US will take more actions, politically, militarily. It will cause a new round of tensions if they happen, and China will have to react. Paul Beckett started another question related to the subsequent congressional delegation, to which the Chinese ambassador replied, we object to it from the very beginning. Over the past decades, China has opposed congressional visits to Taiwan because we believe they violate the One China Principle and the three joint communiques. They violate the commitment of the United States not to develop official relations with Taiwan, as Congress is part of the US government, instead of being an independent, uncontrollable branch. It's obliged to abide by the foreign policy of the United States. So that's why we object to and are very dissatisfied with Senator Markey's visit to Taiwan. It's provocative and unhelpful. Ellen Nickmeyer from Associated Press asked about America's announcement to send warships through the Taiwan Strait. Is that a provocation? What's China's response to that? Qin Gang answered the question sternly. The US side has done too much and gone too far in this region. Since 2012, the US side has had more than 100 navigations through the Taiwan Strait, intensifying the tension and emboldening Taiwan's independent separatist forces. As you have mentioned earlier, 
we have noted what the US military said these days, that they would have a military exercise or navigation again. But I do call on American colleagues to exercise restraint, not to do anything to escalate the tension. So if there's any move damaging China's territorial integrity and sovereignty, China will respond. It is worth mentioning that China has already responded to America's rhetorics about the so-called standardized sea and air passages through Taiwan Strait. Yesterday's video mentioned that USS Ronald Reagan is now sleeping in Japan after a new round of military exercises due to Senator Markey's delegation to Taiwan. In 1996, America's aircraft carrier strike groups, USS Independence and USS Nimitz entered China's coastal waters to pressure the Chinese army militarily. In 2022, USS Ronald Reagan danced the tango in the Western Pacific with the music of China's military drills, hundreds of miles away from Taiwan. 26 years passed, and today's China has deployed two aircraft carriers in the region, ready to fight any invaders. At the same time, the Seventh Fleet decided to let USS Ronald Reagan fall asleep. One viewer asked us whether China would stop America's warships from entering the Taiwan Strait, and we do not know, as we are not fortune tellers. However, we are sure that if one or two US warships pass the Taiwan Strait, they will be greeted wholeheartedly by the Chinese army, and dozens of Chinese warplanes and destroyers will babysit them like parents sending their kids to their kindergartens. Who cares if the US will send its warships and warplanes to the Taiwan Strait or not? The Chinese ambassador is too polite to blame or ridicule the US military, but spokespeople from the Chinese army do not choose their words. Several Chinese destroyers are flexing their muscle in their coastal waters, and they are brand new, not rusty as their American counterparts. Some viewers say China should not develop its military, so Western nations will not be scared. We disagree. China used to be the weakest kingdom in the world after the two opium wars, and if viewers go to England or France and visit their museums, they will find a lot of exhibits that are booties from old China. Suppose China does not have a solid army to defend itself. In that case, militants from the West can even dismantle China's high-speed rails and put them in museums for their grandchildren to worship. Canada, our great country, now boasting the world's most remarkable freedom, human rights and democracy, without a slight whiff of shame, put a Chinese general's tomb in its royal museum in Toronto, Ontario. We agree Qin Gang is a great and unrivaled diplomat, but he is too nice. He should tell the Western media guys in a language they understand. Kevin Barron from Defense One challenged the Chinese ambassador, you talked a lot about what you want the United States to do to reduce tensions. But can you talk briefly about what China will do to change perceptions here, as you mentioned earlier? You see the fear of China ramping up in the political discourse. FBI Director Christopher Wray says in all 50 states, there are active espionage cases against the Chinese, with all sorts of spying and industrial espionage. And as you mentioned in the political sphere, there is a little battle over what Americans should think about China, whether you can do business with China, and in what direction people are supposed to go. What's China going to do to convince more Americans that they are not a threat, and they should not feel a threat, by all of these different rhetorics that Americans are hearing from their security officials and their security news, and what they're seeing in places like Hong Kong where China has removed or forcibly ended democracy and imposed its system, or what it wants. Qin Gang replied, you mentioned the director of FBI's allegations that China is doing espionage. It is a typical presentation of the fear of China. Espionage activities of China in 50 states, do you believe it? Do you have any evidence or proof? It would help if you did not mistake regular exchanges and interactions for spying, a typical threat phobia. It scares people, scares Chinese people, young people. It scares Chinese communities and American people doing business and having people-to-people -people exchanges. It's ideologically driven. You asked the question of Hong Kong. Let me say a few more words. The turbulence in Hong Kong was not caused by any problem with one country, two systems. It was caused by some anti-China forces who used human rights and democracy as a pretext to manipulate the concept of one country, two systems, and undermine Hong Kong's stability and prosperity. Hong Kong's turbulence was a struggle between secession and anti-secession. 
Those anti-China forces instigated chaos in Hong Kong, with the support of external forces, to create trouble for China. They asked for two systems, not in one country. Some people even held high the Union Jack, or the stars and stripes in Hong Kong, chanting, two countries, two systems, and demanding, Hong Kong independence, or returning to British colonial rule. Under such circumstances, China's central government had to defend national sovereignty, security, and development interests to safeguard Hong Kong's long-term stability and prosperity. Hong Kong's turbulence was a battle between violence and anti-violence, law violation and law enforcement. Since the turbulence over proposed legislative amendments in 2019, Hong Kong has experienced serious violence, vandalism, arson, traffic obstruction, attacks on police and assault on citizens. Some extremists even stormed the building of the Hong Kong Legislative Council. The damage and danger they caused far exceeded the January 6 incident. They seriously jeopardized Hong Kong's security, stability, economy, democracy, and even people's lives. You can search for videos of their violent activities on YouTube. You will know that this is never about democracy. It is never a beautiful sight to behold, as Nancy Pelosi called it. Their activities are crimes and absolutely, they are violence. The US is doing a reckoning over the January 6 incident. Likewise, Hong Kong will not allow such violent crimes. Facing the turbulences in 2019, China's central government has decisively introduced the Hong Kong National Security Law, improved the electoral system of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, and adopted the principle of patriots governing Hong Kong. We have taken several measures to uphold and improve the one country, two systems. As a result, Hong Kong has realized a major shift from chaos to stability. The one country, two systems, has returned to the right track. Let me emphasize this. Such a shift has proved that one country is the premise and basis of the two systems, and the two systems are subordinate to and derived from one country. Doubts of one country, two systems are short-sighted. It's too early to say that. Those doom sayings about one country, two systems are doomed to fail. We believe that with one country, two systems, Hong Kong will enter a new era with vigorous economic and social development and sound governance. I just read a figure, a result of a poll that the American business people's confidence in Hong Kong grew by 18% this year compared to last year. Ian Marlowe from Bloomberg cornered the ambassador with another question about China's COVID policy in Hong Kong. I was previously based in Hong Kong until Christmas, and I saw some of my Bloomberg colleagues this morning saying that banks in Hong Kong are now offering hardship money to people to encourage them to move to Hong Kong because no one wants to go there anymore, due to zero COVID policies. Please describe a little bit about your vision, or how long these measures will be in place. And I'm not talking just about Hong Kong but in China. We've seen Condoleezza Rice at the Aspen Forum mocking the zero COVID policy, and in terms of it, beginning to hit China's political reputation, saying that no one wants to replicate China anymore because of these sorts of restrictions that you put on people. I'm wondering if you could give a sense of how long you see these measures being in place, and whether you view them as having any negative impact on China's standing in the world or China's integration with other countries, whether that's in Asia or across the world. Qin Gang answered. I don't understand why Condoleezza Rice mocked China's approach to tackle COVID. This country has the world record for the highest number of infections and the highest number of deaths. Why should she mock China? Given China's size and population, our work on COVID has been successful and great. You're seeing the number of deaths and infections, which are pretty small, and China's economy is returning, experiencing a robust recovery. It is because China puts people in the center of its governance, and the Communist Party of China implements its mission to serve the people wholeheartedly while confronting COVID. We call our approach the dynamic zero COVID policy. It's dynamic and it's not rigid. We readjust our policy according to circumstances, particularly the degree of the spread of COVID. It protected people, China's economy, and the global supply and industrial chains. If China suffers severely from COVID, think about the consequences. At this challenging time, China is still manufacturing and providing various products to countries worldwide, including the United States. 
Of course, like in all the countries, COVID has caused great difficulties for traveling and people's everyday life. It's understandable. China is no exception. So we hope that the situation of COVID will get relaxed sooner so that people can enjoy their regular life and bring economic activities back. Traveling can be restored, which is vital because we have tensions between our two countries. We need more interactions so that people can have a correct mutual understanding. Regarding Qin Gang's statement about China's COVID policy and the comparison of COVID victims in China and the United States, we want to cite some information from Johns Hopkins as of August 21, 2022. The U.S. has a reported number of nearly 94 million cases, and over 1 million and 41,000 Americans died of the virus. In sharp contrast, China has reported less than 2.4 million cases in China mainland, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan. Even though Taiwan and Hong Kong have not controlled the COVID-19 pandemic as well as in China's mainland territory, the whole country is still 40 times better than the United States if we do not consider their population differences. Nearly 30% of Americans have reportedly acquired the virus, and the actual percentage of infections should be higher. China's population is nearly 1.5 billion in all its territories, including Taiwan. Still, only 2.4 million cases have been reported, converting to 1,600 out of a million, which is almost 200 times better than the United States. Moreover, the 43rd and 44th President Obama, the 45th and potentially the 47th President Trump, and the 46th President Biden all acquired the virus in a row, making the United States the only country in the world ruled by three patients from 2009 to 2025, most likely. Still, Condoleezza Rice, the incumbent director of the Hoover Institution, which is based in Stanford University, mocked China for its zero covid policy, disregarding the deaths of over a million Americans, her compatriots whom she should love the most. Is Stanford proud of having such an imaginative director leading a think tank that it has no control? Hong Kong has its problems, not because of the covid virus or the national security law, but the quick rise of world-renowned cities in China mainland, like Guangzhou, Shenzhen and Shanghai, to name a few. Having been a window for China to connect with the world for decades, Hong Kong needs to reposition itself as a service portal connecting China mainland, Taiwan and other nations instead of regarding itself as an indispensable international center like before. Also, the city is less attractive to Western anti-China forces because they cannot instigate hatred and unrest there to deter China. The difficulty in Hong Kong is temporary, and before long, it will be prosperous and attractive to the world again. Evan Osnos, with The New Yorker, asked the ambassador about the timeline of the Taiwan issue. President Xi Jinping has said this is not an issue China should pass from generation to generation. I'd like to know if the events of the last year or two and the conditions in the US-China relationship, or more broadly, in the world, have accelerated that timeline in any way. There was a report recently that some in the US assessed that it may have accelerated China's timeline for reunification. I'm curious if that's the fact. Qin Gang answered, I don't know if there is any specific time, but I do know there is a will. There's a prospect for peaceful reunification, and there is a will of more than 1.4 billion Chinese people for reunification. As we said in the just published white paper on the question of Taiwan, the question of Taiwan was caused when China was weak and chaotic, and we will solve it in the course of national rejuvenation. There is a prospect. However, I don't know if there is a timeline. People are over-nervous about it. And there are lots of speculations on that, which I have found baseless. Evan Osnos pushed his way further, I have to follow up briefly on that. In the event of reunification, how does China anticipate the international reaction to unfold? Do you expect the international community to embrace or reject this development? And are you prepared to handle the consequences? He then clarified the consequences he meant with the ambassador, who had questioned him about them. If, for instance, the rest of the world isolates China, or international businesses respond by withdrawing there. Qin Gang was puzzled, why should they want to isolate China? Josh Rogan answered Qin Gang's question on behalf of even Osnos, if you attack them. Qin Gang replied to both of them, there's no such a presumption. In the first place, Taiwan is a part of China. 
The question of Taiwan is a purely internal affair of China, which brooks no foreign intervention. Secondly, as I mentioned, we will diligently pay the utmost effort to achieve peaceful reunification. We will use non-peaceful means only under the circumstances that Taiwan declares independence by a handful of separatist forces and the intervention of foreign forces. Whatever happens, this is purely an internal affair. You mentioned the international community. Let me say this. Based on the One China principle, 181 countries have diplomatic relations with China mainland. The overwhelming majority of the international community is supportive and accepts the One China policy. On Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, more than 170 countries and international organizations have voiced support for the One China principle. They account for 80% of the global population. China has followed international law and basic norms governing international relations. Why do countries criticize or isolate China because of its internal affair? So I didn't find any legal or practical basis for that. Michael Martina with Reuters followed up on the notion of the U.S. transits of the Taiwan Strait. We expect the U.S. to continue selling weapons to Taiwan shortly. You said China would respond to that, as in the past years of actions. But after Pelosi's visit, we expect China to take a more assertive and aggressive response to these actions than in previous years. Qin Gang stated that in the past years, the United States had sold many weapons to Taiwan, which violated the commitments in the three joint communiques, particularly the joint communique of August 17, 1982, signed between the two countries precisely 40 years ago. We need to read some history. Some say people now have no interest in history or law. And that's how we are in this. Let me read the sentences in the August 17 joint communique. The United States government states that it does not seek to carry out a long-term policy of arms sales to Taiwan, that its arms sales to Taiwan will not exceed, either in qualitative or in quantitative terms, the level of those supplied in recent years since the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China, and that it intends gradually to reduce its sale of arms to Taiwan, leading, over some time, to a final resolution. Has the U.S. resolved this over the past 40 years? No. We haven't seen the United States honor its commitments. They are still going on, the arms sales. The quantities are more and the qualities are more sophisticated. It is written in black and white in the international document. The United States government has reneged on this commitment. So, of course, we strongly oppose arms sales from the United States. This is the move to change the status quo. This is the move to create tensions. And this is the move obstructing our efforts to achieve peaceful reunification. David Lawler from Axios started another topic about One China Two Systems to solve the Taiwan issue. You said the overwhelming will of the Chinese people is for reunification. I would like to know if you are aware of the overwhelming will of people in Taiwan based on the many polls in elections. I know you said that you want to change that but at present is not to be unified by China. Qin Gang emphasized, no matter how different the political systems are between the mainland and Taiwan, the historical fact that both sides belong to one and same China remains unchanged and will never change. And the fact that people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait are Chinese remains unchanged and will never change. We share the same root, cultural heritage, and national identity. We fully understand Taiwan has been separated from our motherland for decades. We fully understand the different political and social systems. We fully understand the sentiments of Chinese people in Taiwan. So that's why we have designed the policy of one country, two systems. That is to accommodate the differences, realities and people's sentiments, and it is a democracy, also a great invention in the world. Can you imagine any place in the United States with a different political and social system? Although I understand the federal and local differences, your overarching system is the same. We have shown great goodwill and tolerance in Taiwan to usher in peaceful reunification. The current political system can continue after reunification. Two systems is democracy. David Lawler raised his next question regarding the one country, two systems. Does it still exist in Hong Kong? 
After getting a yes from the Chinese ambassador, he continued, so, does Beijing decide what both systems are, or does Taiwan decide? For Hong Kong, obviously, Beijing is defining both systems. Qin Gang replied, the future solutions to the political systems, the Taiwan solution, will be negotiated by people of both sides. It's a democratic process. The interests and concerns of Taiwan will be fully considered and accommodated based on the principle of one China. When people talk about one country, two systems, please don't forget the foundation and precondition is one China. We cannot allow the foundation or precondition of one China to be denied by the two systems. If there's no one country, there will be no two systems. Many viewers think the Chinese ambassador is too polite and soft, and they do not believe Qin Gang used to be regarded as a wolf warrior when he served as the foreign affairs spokesman many years ago. Western media have changed their perception of him, no longer calling him a wolf. Qin Gang wanted to deliver a message to the West that if Taiwan declared independence, there would only be one country, one system. It is the last chance for the Taiwan authorities to decide whether they will accept the one country, two systems in the coming years or even months. In many videos, we have mentioned that Taiwan is not Ukraine. However, some Western politicians want to play the same trick in Taiwan as they did in Ukraine. In less than 20 days in August 2022, three batches of U.S. lawmakers and officials have visited Taiwan in a row. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senator Markey and the Governor of Indiana, Eric Holcomb, slapped Beijing's face consecutively by visiting the Chinese renegade province of Taiwan. They are forcing Beijing to take over Taiwan, so the US and its allies, like Germany and the UK, can strangulate China like they are sanctioning Russia. China mainland and the West both know that China needs time to be more robust militarily and economically, so it can deter any aggressors on its doorstep and avoid a new aid alliance invasion. Chinophobia drives US politicians crazy, and they want to drive Beijing crazier, so Chinese leaders would start a civil war with Taiwan at the wrong time, when the US can still summon some allies to fight China in the West Pacific. When Joe Biden won the 2020 election, we predicted there would only be a one-year ceasefire between China and the United States, meaning the relations between Beijing and Washington would deteriorate from 2022 onward. Unfortunately, our projection has come true. Still, it is not the worst case yet. When Republicans win the midterm election, Joe Biden will be even weaker, unable to stop the military-industrial complex from initiating a war in the West Pacific. Although the U.S. government and military helped Nancy Pelosi visit Taiwan, they did not confront China during Beijing's military drills. USS Reagan, which most people believed would protect Taiwan, returned to its base in Japan. Ian Marlow with Bloomberg raised one more question about the two systems practice in Hong Kong. Because the national security law took effect in a hurry, even people like the chief executive and others didn't see it before it was enacted. I'm just wondering when those of us, who were in Hong Kong, who saw Taiwan opinion change against China throughout what happened in Hong Kong, I think a lot of people in Taiwan look at what happens in Hong Kong and say, we don't want what is happening there. So do you think the national security law in Hong Kong will also go to Taiwan? Qin Gang replied, Hong Kong has been ruled by British colonialists for more than 100 years. Naturally, it takes time for people to get used to the new reality that Hong Kong has returned to its motherland. Hong Kong returned to China just 25 years ago. And over the past 25 years, you can see that generally speaking, one country, two systems, the policy is successful. There were ups and downs, twists and turns, like what we saw three years ago in Hong Kong. But we learn and draw lessons and we improve. What we are doing is improve one country, two systems, for the benefit of long-lasting stability and prosperity. If we make a success story of one country, two systems, in Hong Kong, it will help our compatriots in Taiwan to understand better one country, two systems, and to think about the future better. Nahal Tusi with Politico provoked the ambassador. Let me start by how you're approaching all of this. You're sticking to the talking points. You're often not really answering the question. It's pretty standard, I guess, in the diplomatic world. I was just curious as a Chinese diplomat, do you genuinely feel empowered? 
Do you feel that the foreign ministry has power in your system? And where do you see Chinese diplomacy going in the years ahead? Because if the US and China will fight or be rivals, wherever diplomacy is going will be a big credit. Can you talk a little bit about Chinese diplomacy? Qin Gang chuckled. First of all, I'm the Chinese ambassador, not a freelance journalist. His words amused everybody in the room. I must represent my government's positions and the will and wish of the Chinese people. He continued. And what I said to you, actually, is heartful. I'm not telling lies, not spreading disinformation or scaring people. I just tell you the truth and facts. As everybody has heard, I'm not always sticking to the talking points. Of course, we have talking points on thorny issues, like what officials of the White House and the State Department are doing. But I give more elaborations on our policies. And if you conclude that what I talked about are all stereotypes and rhetorics, you are wasting your time. I hope that everybody here today finds this conversation necessary and helpful, and it is my wish. From my point of view, I gave plenty of information. To answer your question, what is China's diplomacy? China's diplomacy is to be friendly with the rest of the world, to protect China's interests better, as diplomacy of any other country is doing. And also, China's diplomacy will work for peace, security, and joint development. Here in the United States, my colleagues and I would like to be a bridge linking the Chinese and American people. I am not here in this country only talking and lecturing. At this challenging moment, I want to listen, communicate with people, reach out to people of different communities, and listen to people for their observations. Why our relationship now is going downhill. I will ask for their wisdom about how we can get out of the difficulty. What can we do to make our relations stable and productive so that our relations will not be driven by fear but by common interests? And I need people to help, telling me their suggestions, so I can digest them and report to Beijing. My role is a bridge, a listening post, and a helping hand. Nahal Tussi asked whether Qin Gang would give each of the journalists a separate interview at some point. You want to be a bridge, sharing our wisdom. And I'm not saying any of us are gonna give you any advice but maybe. He stopped and Qin Gang gave an affirmative answer. You're always welcome. Steve Clemens with The Hill asked the ambassador how China would respond to a possible visit to Taiwan by a new House speaker, say, a Republican. A lot of Republicans applauded Nancy Pelosi's trip, he explained, and a lot of people anticipate, perhaps, the Republicans coming in to control the House. And thus, you may see another Speaker of the House want to go to Taiwan quickly, maybe Kevin McCarthy, maybe another leader. How would China respond in the case of Speaker of the House going to Taiwan? Qin Gang replied, I have noted that there was no Republican on Nancy Pelosi's visit, although, as you mentioned, they are supportive of the visit. And China has always been opposing congressional visits to Taiwan. The Speaker of the House is not a person in the street. He or she carries great sensitivity and importance. And he, or she, when visiting Taiwan, violates the US commitment that the United States will not maintain official links with Taiwan. I can't answer hypothetical questions. Let's wait and see. But China will make our decisions or take our actions to defend our territorial integrity and national sovereignty. I hope that Nancy Pelosi is the last speaker to visit Taiwan. It was the last question Qin Gang answered that day, and the interview ended. Most journalists did not get what they had expected. It is worth mentioning that the interview lasted 90 minutes, and the Chinese ambassador answered around 20 questions raised by journalists from over 10 world-renowned news agencies like Reuters, Bloomberg, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and the like. Most of those questions were provocative, with little difference from the accusations of some Western officials. As Qin Gang answered all their questions flawlessly, they were disappointed. They should have regarded the Chinese diplomats' replies as diplomatic rhetorics of little value to their audiences. Although those news outlets could not cover Qin Gang's mouth, they were reluctant to relay his voice to the English-speaking world. As we said in a video published one year ago, English is an international language, or a world language, resulting from hundreds of years of colonization, which is a scar and shame to the whole human race, 
China has been in an underprivileged situation having its voice heard. When Donald Trump, Joe Biden and other officials or lawmakers blame China for every problem the US has, they talk to the world in English, the first or second language for many people on earth. This universal language is one of their rarely found commendable merits compared with their counterparts in other non-English speaking nations. Western media, likewise, dominate public opinion, and as a result, they frequently muffle different voices and amplify their narratives. As we said earlier, we have not found any Western media report on what the Chinese ambassador said to their audiences, and DFTW is the first channel delivering his words. Most likely, those journalists wanted to find some thrilling headlines, expecting Qin Gang to leak some sensitive information. However, they did not expect the Chinese ambassador to the US is a seasoned diplomat, much more experienced and composed than his counterpart, Mr. Burns, who is anything but a bridge to link the United States and China together.